two, one. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, we're going to do a workshop on consensus building. Um, I've never been through this process or, or let it at least explicitly. I think it's implicit in education and in, in you know, team building and, and meetings and briefings, but I'm introducing it because I think it's, it's super critical to intellectual spaces and especially people who have the, the desire and the capacity to build consensus. But to me, it's obvious why <clears throat> people are, are turned off by it. And there's not an obvious incentive. There's a sort of, um, maybe it's too hard or it threatens people's beliefs or they think it's gonna be groupthink. But I'm here to dispel those myths and actually, you know, I'm, I'm pleased we've got uh, a decent sized group here. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but um, so hopefully you've all read the article <clears throat> because I think there's, yeah, I was going through it last night and there's, I always find there's almost too much in there for me to, to break down my own articles. So I do the best I can to, to kind of run through it, but there's just too much there. And the kind of case in point is the, the process itself that I'm not a facilitator. We don't actually have the time to go through a whole process. It might take hours just to kind of, just to kind of introduce the process and, 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 and table some of the, the topics we'd want to build consensus around. I'll just be, you know, forthright from the outset that I want to build multiple consensuses in different spaces. And a, a key instrument of that is, is John Rawls idea of overlapping consensus, right? So if we all have different worldviews and ideas, Im imagine a Venn diagram where those circles overlap, that's where the overlapping consensus is. And so in, in complexity, we can find common ground and it can be built in fact. Um, <clears throat> so I want to build um, actually, you know, with Jeremy and others, uh, and I've talked to, I've talked to Layman about this actually, um, after the article, Layman and I recorded a, a conversation on consensus building. So that's on my channel, but I want to build a left consensus. And I feel there already is a kind of de facto left consensus through the Michael Brooks network, because so many of his guests, um, there's a lot of diversity there, but they have, they have common ground. They have different specialties and expertises, but, uh, and, and through the Bernie coalition more broadly, you know, there's a kind of tacit consensus and I, I'm arguing just on one level that it needs to be more explicitly built so that uh, different leftist communities actually are working in concert when, when, when we go out and work independently. <clears throat> so there's less arguments and more kind of just um, information sharing and less, less infighting, right? And we, we see a lot of infighting, whether it's over tactics or, or policy or whatever. Um, and the process of building consensus actually helps us each for whatever baggage or dogma we're each individually carrying it'll help us you know purge or cleanse that that kind of stuff right so um you know just as an example i like to use as a sort of case in point something that we should are we already have a consensus on there shouldn't be much of a, a public issue about is climate change um, because maybe you've heard the figure like 97% of climate scientists agree. Well, I've seen that, I've seen that, uh, contextualize that it's actually that 3% comes from samples of scientists that are not climate scientists. So it, so it skews the number a bit. So, so uh, but I, I think I froze a bit. Uh, so the actual number is closer to a hundred percent, a hundred percent of climate scientists agree. So with that, you know, it's important to understand that climate denial is something that's funded by the fossil fuel industry, right? So if we, if we just understand these kind of basic premises, 
then you can then we can start to build a kind of reasons reasonable worldview for why these different um, uh, ideologies exist and how that obviously compromises the integrity of uh, you know political agendas and epistemic communities. So um, you know, I would hope here, like we have eleven people, we that we already have uh, an implicit hundred percent consensus on certain things. Climate change is real; it's both um, anthropogenic and natural. It would be happening if humans weren't here, but of course, we're complicating the process. Uh, you know, we live in a heliocentric solar system, which itself kind of you know spins around the uh the galaxy uh the world is round not flat i mean the fact that um people disagree with these things um is is um just <clears throat> tripping us up you know creating hurdles for any kind of intellectual um project so, uh, so I wanted to do this as like a practice session and also invite each one of you, whoever could show up to play some sort of key role, like as a facilitator or as an expert on something, um, there will be points in the process where everybody is completely equal and uh, everything is kind of democratic, right? And so that, that makes sure everybody's heard, that makes sure we test certain propositions through a kind of democratic process but it requires i just wanted to kind of foreground that this i think this process is is way beyond me it needs institutional support you know think think tanks and media organizations should be pursuing it but <clears throat> i i explained the the leftist part because you know, I want I want a left I want a strong left consensus so the political left can attract more people from across the spectrum and achieve its universal goals, right? So something like healthcare or education, you know, advancing these things are for everybody. They're not partisan projects, but they need more support, and they've already got broad support, but they get blocked by. Uh, you know, people like Mitch McConnell who are who are blocking uh, all these sorts of motions for stimulus checks right now. Um, <clears throat> so, but I want to build a left consensus, but also obviously these tools should be useful for everybody, right? And so if, if conservatives or centrists could build a consensus and it has to be an authentic consensus, right? I, as I said at the beginning, like this is not groupthink. We want to actually immunize against uh, a group think occurring. And so just by reading the literature on these subjects and going through the process, I think we can all learn these things in a, in a really like, in, like deep way that it, that it sticks with us. And so that's part of, part of what I want to do is just to learn, learn this stuff better by doing it. So when I do the STOA events, you know, I'll be calling on those people as well to to play key roles and it's interesting because the lang in the language of the eight breaths architecture uh it already it it, it has a, a title called stewards stewards and as well as senseis as one of the other key roles and peter Lindbergh already is the steward of the stoa and various things so this is just so key. And so aside from the left consensus and the general idea of consensus and how different communities kind of pursue that and, and build solidarity and purge bullshit, uh, I want to build consensus. Um, sorry, I keep cutting out. I want to build consensus around um, my own project and my own work too, which involves inviting critique right and and also each uh, person who, who follows me like increasing their literacy and having conversations about it and um influencing each other but not in a kind of um captured way so that like if someone's giving me money that i'm just doing their their bidding if it's uh, counterproductive so so when i say build consensus around my work i mean that includes 
just some of the neutral ideas I advance, like writing about um, Benjamin Bratton or, or smart cities or whatever, but also more importantly, perhaps the critiques, right? So critique of in integral, critique of the intellectual dark web and uh, you know, critique of game B in lar and critique of emerge in large part, I'm trying to already draw from, from a de facto consensus, right? So with the case of like Jordan Peterson, there was hundreds and hundreds of articles from across the left, different publications and people on Twitter and YouTube and, you know, critiquing and taking him down in various ways. And it was just so comprehensive. There was so much coverage and most of it I considered quite good faith. Like people really inter interrogating his history, his research uh, and kind of deconstructing it, you know, poking holes in it. Um, and of course is his persona itself. Uh, and there was even a conference that was like a Peters, you know, a debunking Peterson conference, which Peterson was sort of invited to and welcome to debate people like Richard Wolf, and and Doug Lane was there, Michael Brooks. Um, I participated virtually. That was kind of um, a, a consensus building project, even though it wasn't explicit. And so, um, you know, I was really pleased that that happened and that was organized. Um, even though it didn't make much of an impact, you know, that was kind of, that was kind of a, a, a sad trade-off, like, but at least it happened. And, but beyond that, you know, each person that went after Peterson or each person that publishes an article in general and critiques in general, it, there's not uh, often a lot of solidarity and um, just consistency across the board. And it, it 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 depowers us as a as a movement and it's it's um you know P peterson or any of the idw figures are out there kind of promoting their own brand and and their own work and they're doing the opposite of consensus you know they're kind of they have a kind of hyper pluralism where they all tolerate each other <clears throat> but they're all doing quite different things and then they might have a sophomore kind of debate about you know ethics or something but then it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere because they don't have any form of political consensus between them, and and fundamentally that's that's what Rawls's um, concept of overlapping consensus was about. Like you can't have a liberal democracy if you don't um, foster that that um, overlap. So <clears throat> what else? Um, there's an idea of consensus reality. Obviously, um, I, I think we live in a we live in a, a common reality, but that's not obvious to everybody. The idea of meta modernism, you know, I've I've sort of participated in uh, Hanzi's meta modern space and adjacent spaces for four for four years, and tried to share research that exists out there and try to build a consensus around that concept. And most people, it seems, are interested in sort of, uh, and I'm guilty of this too, but trying to, to shoehorn their own work into a meta-modern paradigm. Uh, and I think if, if you do that in a way that's consistent with the literature, whether it's implicit meta-modern literature or, um, or explicit, uh, I think that I think that's okay, but people who try to, you know, uh, co-opt these theories for whatever agenda, I think that's counterproductive. And I think, as uh, a sort of intellectual community, ostensibly, we we have common goals. We we all seek shared understanding, and so to be effective at all, I think we actually have to build consensus. And so. I want to build consensus around the definition itself. Like, what is it? What isn't it? How do we operationalize it between us? <clears throat> and uh, you know, what's what's true politically? Who are you know? Um, just uh, sort of crudely speaking, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in politics? Because um, regardless of what people think about politics 
it actually is a lever of change and it has externalities and knock-on effects and spillover effects in the real world. And the more people who are informed and can participate in a, in a non-complicated way, like without any being pressured and, or, um, you know, um, uh, cycling misinformation um, and having their actual advocacy energy converted into change rather than wasted and, and suppressed, um, that it's just better for everybody. And so ultimately like beneath all these various crises and the meta crises, there's an epistemic crisis crisis. Like even in academia itself, there's just a bunch of um, just, I mean, whatever, postmodern gibberish or um, intellectual masturbation or just work that doesn't go anywhere, that doesn't, it doesn't make an impact, just obscure journals um, or there's a, a redundancy. There's too many different journals, too many different um, advocacy groups, and they, they, um, unavoidably talk past each other or they're speaking a different language. And, um, you know, I believe that uh, convergence is happening. So with all the talk of emergence, convergence is a counterpoint and there's, there's abundant evidence and theories that actually track and detail the convergence, a convergence of knowledge, society, technology, evolution itself, organizations, so, uh, so I called my article Convergence for Consensus Building because I think these concepts go together. And in the spirit of what the STOA or any of these communities are trying to do over the years, you know, through mimetic mediation and whatnot, over the years, I think we can agree that there is a kind of convergence, uh, or at least it should happen normatively and that all the answers we're seeking, we can kind of ans help answer for each other and feel like we're part of something true and solidaristic that is actually going to be a part of, of the permanent change in the world. Um, what else? So, um, sorry to just kind of ramble. Um, I guess another thing I'll mention just with, with healthcare specifically is like the idea of single payer, right? So, so healthcare is a universal human right. This is established in international law, but it's not provided for by countries like the United States because of private interest basically capturing the law in the United States and, and, and the, um, um, the policy. And so, uh, and with economics, there's obviously main sort of mainstream economics, but there's different theories within that. It's a very complex field and it's very politicized, right? So when we talk about uh, political economy, that's the, the way those two fields rub up against each other. And there's debates in economics and the, the kind of biggest debate going on today is around modern monetary theory. And that's this kind of Archimedean point that says actually states have the capacity to spend sort of in an unlimited fashion on public infrastructure and, and you know, human well-being and uh, environmental restoration and sustainability and renewable energy and whatnot, right? All the things that we need um, crystallized through what's called the, the Green New Deal and, but then there's debates about, well, can, you know, should it happen? Can it happen? And a lot of debates are corrupted and politicized. So, so consensus building as well as dialogue and deliberation are practices and routes to overcome debates, to circumvent that, that bullshit. And I just don't see it practiced in, uh, in enough spaces, uh, whether publicly or privately, and obviously businesses do it. I touch on that in my article, and it's very effective for, for team building and for uh, coordinating people's actions independently. So what I'm advocating for, again, just to bring it full circle, 
is for intellectuals and intellectual spaces to in, embrace the, the conflict that is entailed with this process and to you know, subordinate um, parts of our ideology that we're not sure about because we all have uh, uncertainties and, and I, none of us can be experts in everything. So, um, um, so we need to bring our, our specialties to the table, our, our, our confidence and our humility and try to teach each other and try to build consensus and, and see where our consensus overlaps and then kind of respect that uh, result. And um, assuming we've demonstrated something effective or impressive, that then that can be copied, you know, duplicated, exported, whatnot, and, and others will, will take it up. But again, as I said at, at the top, like I'm not a facilitator, and I say in the article, I think this process requires a lot of investment, of investment of money, of people's time, of different cohorts. So have and different having different levels of participants, teachers and students. Um, <clears throat> but it always coming back to this, say, let's say this eight breaths process. If we use that as a group process uh, uh, template, that um, I'm trying to admit someone that um, that uh, we can actually harvest each time we go through that process, the, the work involved. And so something um, more than the sum of its parts emerges, right? So this isn't just Brent Cooper leading his ideology and say, hey, everybody follow me. I've consolidated a lot of other meta theories and meta critiques that I think already are a kind of implicit consensus. And is again, especially the Bernie movement, which because people were so rigid about like political identity, they didn't want to be preached to, right? Like, that goes all over, like nobody wants to, to change, but by submitting to the process, you're volunteering to change and not knowing the outcome. But we have a kind of normative goal and there's a also a concept of normative incrementalism which i write about in another article called social paradoxes and meta problems that normative incrementalism like agreeing we have a shared goal and incrementally working towards it through a process is the only way according to this research to overcome social paradoxes which are like wicked and sticky problems that just sort of seem to reproduce themselves in all of our work and policy, and you just can't get away from it. And and ultimately, it's a it's a public health and a public knowledge pr problem, because knowledge is not being uh, sort of distributed and activated uh, among people. Like we we and and I guess I'll close with a point about conspiracy because there's many many theories and very little consensus about what's real and what's not real. Um, but there is sort of a tacit consensus, again, in academia, if you go through the different literatures, there's different levels of consensus. And so uh, the first level is kind of debunking most conspiracy theory and kind of uh, psychologizing and contextualizing conspiracy theorists, right? If not denigrating them a bit. But uh, at, Go, going into, into uh, higher levels of that discourse, there is a recognition that there is kind of institutional conspiracies and kind of the effects of conspiracy such that we kind of live in a conspiracy. Like just, we can just accept that sort of premise without all the, no, the nonsense that's packaged with it, with anti-vax and aliens and tinfoil hats and whatever. Um, you know, it, it's really, really difficult to know what's what about say the intelligence world when we've been fed a steady diet of like born movies and bond movies and you know things like this it's like regardless of how much we're aware of it we're, our thinking is actually corrupted on this subject and so when it comes to like how covert operations actually happen how um, cover-ups happen um it's so complex that it happens without the 
people involved sometimes being aware of how how it's happening or what's happening so having a consensus around conspiracy is part of a kind of authentic disclosure project where the disclosure is not hey guys aliens have been here the whole time they're they're in cahoots with the government but that like we can unpack why people think that what what the scientific realities of extraterrestrials are and and what actually matters right regardless of ufos and this is why hanzi kind of denigrates ufology because it's a dis ultimately it's a distraction right so we can have interesting discussions about it but ultimately it's a distraction from thinking clearly about politics and uh, and political change so <clears throat> I think that's a sufficient kind of riff or rant and there's lots of details we can go into. I've got my notes up about my article. Um, so I don't know, what do you guys think? I'm happy to like have a round table, uh, try, to, uh, try to build consensus around a particular topic, um, basically use this session to, to um, fulfill the experiment. Uh... I'm ready to talk. All right. Um, I'll, I'll let I'll I'll ask Jeremy to like host generally. I appreciate his his function there. Um, but that otherwise, go ahead, Carrick. So I've kind of thought of a working definition. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Okay. I found a kind of a working definition of consensus. I would say consensus is the space between dogmatism and eclecticism. So dogmatism would be where your, your consensus, it's kind of a pseudo consensus. You have people kind of working in tandem and there's coherent action, but, there's, but there isn't any room for validation and qualification of agreements. So people cohere, but there's no space for disagreement and hashing out anything. So that would be one side where you have a pseudo consensus. The other pseudo consensus would be what I would call eclecticism, which is where you're so focused on finding agreement on your propositions and such that you basically just throw everything in the kitchen sink and, and, and you don't make any room for validating and qualifying whether or not those agreements are actually coherent. You could agree on two things that functionally cancel each other out and that's that's how you get into eclecticism because you're just so focused on reaching agreement that you're no longer looking at whether your agreements actually gel together. So that's kind of like the opposite of dogmatism. I would say consensus would basically be functional coherence and functional agreement and they're invalidated and qualified on both ends. So there's kind of a coordination. And one of the most important things about that I've that I've thought about when it in terms of sense making and consensus building is the more people that are implicated in any given agreement that you come to, the more rigorous your validation process should be. So one thing that I could, that people build consensus on a lot in this era are different ideas of gender. That's kind of my big thing. Since gender basically affects everyone, if you're gonna build any action points off of your consensus on gender, whatever it is, you need to make sure it's ex you need to make sure it's rigorously validated from experiential knowledge, abstract knowledge, and concepts that are coherent. Um, you look at the implications of your ideas on gender. You look at how you're explicitly talking about gender. You you the bar should be set higher the more people's lives it affects. If you're going to be building out action points, coordinated action around the a proposition you make on gender, that affects so many people. You need to make sure it's really, really up to snuff and you're really, really avoiding dogmatism or eclecticism. Like you have to be, you, know, you need more validation from different fields of study. You need more, you need to make sure they cohere as well as possible. They don't, that you're not just quant qualifying, you're also quantifying your knowledge. So, um, yeah, uh, the space between dogmatism and eclecticism as validated as possible, given the actions you want to take and how many people that affect. Thanks. Um, I just want to make a, a quick a quick point. That's um, that's really helpful. All those distinctions, and 
I would say too, like, like with complex subjects and a subject like this, like, like gender, like it's important to strive for a provisional consensus at least. So, so we don't have to have a like concretized consensus at the end of it, but it can be provisional anywhere where there's boundaries and, and ignorance that, that we can't access. The idea of it being provisional is good. So we kind of hold off until we're sure later. But with that, I also want to say it's good to err on the side of caution. And by that, I mean, in the, in favor of supporting the gender theory that actually uh, accommodates the most people. Right. And so I'm just a cis white male dude, boring, <laughs> like traditional, but, but, uh, but I embrace whatever, whatever Judith Butler's cutting edge, um, you know, um, dissertation is if it helps more people, right? If it's more honest about history and groups that have been suppressed, right? And so it's way better to err on, on that side, if even if you don't understand it all, to just say, to just throw your hands up and go, yeah, okay, there's whatever, however many genders, because it's not, it doesn't really matter to the average person. It doesn't really have, you know, negative consequences. Um, and, and academics in the first place are trying to kind of vie for knowledge supremacy and put forward the best ideas and build consensus around them. So um, yeah, thanks, Eric, and I'll shut up now. Awesome. Can we uh, get Ursula next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting, very interesting to work things out here. It's a quite complex uh, map. Um, and well, I've been a steward of the art of hosting conversations that matter for the past 10 years and worked with this for maybe 15 years in mm. super complex environments like European Commission. I've been an EU official for like the last 25 years. Now I'm on leave and completely independent because I didn't want to serve any these entities with my time and uh, energy and I choose to like to see where I give my energy basically but it's been a great playground and preparation for anything I do and uh, the eight breaths I, I actually call it a bit differently depending on where I go because it's a bit too easel yeah breaths but then I do I do the breathing with it, with the groups that I work with, so they understand why, how divergence work, works and how convergence work and what the, the fucking grown zone is, because that is the most important <laughs> part of it, basically. I don't know how much you've all been looking at this map, um, but if you breathe it, and I actually literally make people stand up, breathe in, hold the air as long as they can, and then let I do I let it go one moment and then we see did they compete and it, that doesn't matter I just collect how did it feel and then with that I build an opinion of what is a grown zone yeah so that's where I'm starting I'm inviting people into the process to because in the end you need a lot of sensing yeah so you said you're not a facilitator and I really appreciate your honesty about where your strengths are and maybe more what you can what you cannot so this is authentic authenticity and the process is neutral we spoke a lot of content and you particularly uh spoke a lot of content print you can build a weapon factory using this process yeah so it's still your choice of what are you actually using it for because it bloody works yeah and you need to decide beforehand where you walking into with this because it's just super powerful and i've never failed applying it never ever because uh, i mean what is failure <laughs> any context you know any group has its own speed and by applying it correctly you're finding out okay what what speed does this group need no, are we done in two days? Are we done in two hours? Are we, do we stay up all night to get it fixed because there's so much passion, whatever, yeah? And you cannot do a step, if you go too fast, if you let a step 
um, how do you call it, if you drop a step and you think, no, we have to be efficient, oh my God, everything explodes and you're put, pulled back to where you're supposed to collect the pieces again. Yeah. Experience. That's what I love about this process because it's organic. It's so organic. And there's not a person who sat down in his little room and designed it. When I joined the Art of Hosting movement, we had five breaths. And then with more and more refinement, it's now up to eight. I hope it doesn't get more because <laughs> it just is too over complex. And we could do with maybe seven. Yeah, but okay, we now have eight. Fine with me. And I do this with people when they have a, to see, like, for example, um, someone trying to form a party, political party of all different realms. I applied it there with young people who were like all over the place and we ended up with five topics, a tandem managing each topic and they had a roadmap. Yeah. So whenever you feel, no, I'm not sharing the common purpose anymore, you drop off. And anyone who enters later can join the journey. You just need to give them a little, you know, finding their own shared purpose. And someone said before, um, yeah, we can have all the different values. It's not a brainwash machine. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. We can, you know, be of whatever backgrounds. Just what do we care for? And then slowly, slowly this red thread becomes visible, especially with the harvesting bit. And I'm not on a Discord, so I don't know how much um, harvesting happens in store. Some Usually this is the weak point. Now that we don't start out harvesting and we don't start out reflecting on what happened and we don't start, you know, to make a different move. So I'm really appreciating you taking it up in the consensus part. But if we don't start correctly in the beginning with calling and do you share my calling? Does it grow? Does it change? Could be that the caller drops out of the process. You know, if Peter doesn't want to continue the store, mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't die. Maybe someone else does something else. But he, you know, he was the caller. So mm -hmm. this is so fascinating because it's organic. And whoever joins on whatever point in the journey chooses the dose, the, how much they give or take. Yeah. And the other thing is you need commitment. Someone spoke about commitment. Um, if you're not committing, you're anyway out. Because mm. you can't fake it. This with this process, nobody can fake it. Because in the end, and may and it, I love it with um, unequal communities. I once did it, and then I, I'll stop. I did it in many different places, but one was a German-based research on sustainability research institute. All males in the management. There were fellows that from all over America and New Zealand. They didn't understand what happened. So I did a storytelling process using that framework. In the end, we had all female rapporteurs because the men couldn't understand when is the moment they had to, to be visible. They couldn't understand, decipher the strategic important moments for them to appear. So they didn't. In the end, they were so furious because the organic life emerged that was needed. Yeah. So I love it because um, the shy people can come in, the introverts can come in, um, the people who don't have the same mother tongue, who maybe have very little literally literal formulation ways. So that's why I love it for any type of group where you have a huge divergence because it's very just. Yeah. It's a very, without having to build any um, type of framework on top of it, the organic part of the group just demands its life. And that's what I love about it. And now I stop because I could just bring a lot of um, examples also, but uh, I want to like, let's hear others as well. Thanks a Thank, lot. Thanks so much. I really value your experience and, and all those contributions. That's uh, uh, super uh, insightful. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, I'd like to first to go to Dominic next. Thanks, Jeremy. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah. 
Thanks, Ursula. Um, a lot of what you're describing reminds me a lot of my own work. And uh, one of the, the things that I thought I would offer here is the value of, of process awareness. Um, and it comes up in, in both what Ursula and Carrick have said, that there's very often a possibly not entirely conscious uh, motivation to create a result and that the underlying um, motivators or, or uh, uh, cultural pressures around those results are not necessarily open to everybody. Um, the process-oriented uh, methodology is available for anybody to look at. Uh, you can look at uh, the Deep Democracy Institute. Um, there's a reasonable body of work. It's not particularly academically inclined. I don't know if many of you know about it, but nobody really talks about process work within either the Emerge arena or within the IDW or within the uh, integral world, but there are some very, very successful uh, approaches to dealing with the types of problems that we have here. I've been working uh, like you, Ursula, with facilitation. I was raised in South Africa, I facilitated uh, a lot of uh, meetings and uh, consensus building work in extremely highly conflict loaded situations. Um, and some of the things that I think are extremely valuable for me in those contexts is understanding that the intellectual agreements that we can come to will be eaten for lunch by the undealt with emotional content, the stuff that Ursula calls uh, the embodiment, the stuff that we uh, don't necessarily have rational experience, uh, rational explanations for, but which may well drive our experiences. And I'd like to just give an example here, Brent, is that, for example, in my experience as a facilitator, I see you inhabiting at least three or four different roles that I'm not entirely sure you're aware of. And uh, those roles have very different rank and privilege, uh, depending on the context in which they're being presented. But because those contexts are not consciously agreed, it's very difficult for people in this room, if it was not a homogenous group of people, to disagree with you, because there are subtle shifts in language, uh, there are subtle uses of, of power relations. And it's incredibly important in creating those uh, uh, sustainable consensus that Kerrick is talking about uh, to include a very high degree of, of uh, feedback from within the, the community that's participating on a non-intellectual level. So it's not simply about validating ideas, but validating uh, the uh, non-rational materials that will eventually underpin these experiences so that those uh, normative increments are actually built on felt experience and not only on uh, clever ideas. I think I'll stop there. Th thanks so much, Dominic. I'll just uh, say, say some more things quickly. I really appreciate that too, your and your experience uh, with conflict resolution. So both you and Ursula together, I think that's um, very powerful kind of history and uh, very useful here. And of course, I welcome critique. And so I'm hearing everything you're saying, and I, I agree completely. I, what comes to mind for me too is another sort of geopolitical issue I want to build consensus around. And uh, obviously, I'm not I'm not leading this process, but the Israel Palestine conflict. And I, I bring that in because I think my understanding approaching it as a student is that there is an international consensus already, right? That's what Noam Chomsky says, essentially, but that the issue becomes politicized on, in an ongoing way. And of course, everybody and their dog has an opinion about it. And that just that just increases, right? As, as populations grow up and, and the political climate shifts. Meanwhile, there's no resolution, right? And I'm seeing videos on Twitter of, you know, IDF soldiers, you know, knocking on people's doors at 2 a.m. And, and intimidating them and whatever. So it's like, there's a real sort of truth to be uh, 
unpacked and explored there. And, and the, obviously the consensus would happen on many different levels, like a consensus of international observers, obviously, but also consensus of the communities involved. And I, I agree in the kind of what Ursula is saying, it can be weaponized. I mean, if it's done correctly, I think it's, it is the opposite of groupthink. And I've actually, I've got some really useful quotes here from an article titled Groupthink versus Consensus. Groupthink is natural, consensus requires effort. Groupthink is invisible, consensus must be intentional. Groupthink may, be, may indicate drifting, consensus is all about rowing together. And so, and, and so on, and there's more good um, descriptions, but the point is just, you know, I, I, I trust the process and I would trust it at a number of levels if it's being pursued authentically and, yeah, I, I think we're headed in the right direction. I, I'm not, I'm going to stop talking because I want to hear from everybody else. Thanks. Who would want to unmute next? I see how nobody's in the chat asking. So I wonder if anyone has any percolating thoughts. Um, if uh, nobody else wants to go, I wanted to piggyback off of what Ursula and Dominic were saying. Um, just, I just, realize I've spoken I recently, so. I, I saw Yo Johan raise his hand, so if yeah, if sure. he wants if to go, and then Karen can Johan go. And, and then Ryan, actually, Ryan has his hand raised too. And then oh, okay. Back to Karen. Okay. Yeah. Um, so th thank you so much, Brent, for first of all, inviting everyone here for, for getting us together. Um, Ursula, if I understood you correctly, there is a element that's necessary where everyone feels to be part of the process where they're kind of like pulled along on an experiential level. And uh, I admit, Brent, <laughs> this is please not a criticism, but just my own experience for the first half hour that you were talking, there were like two moments when I felt my attention slip and I could have raised my hand, but I was like, no, like, you know, there's other people on the call. If I had been the only one, I would have done, done so obviously. Um, and for me, what came up when I was asking myself, why did my attention slip? Is that what is the practical question that we're after today? So like if, if, if you could make a request of the 11 people on the call, uh, no, 13 people on the call besides yourself, what would be the practical question for them so that if at the end of the call, we all answer in the affirmative, you feel you've accomplished something as a, as a single practical question because then I can connect it to something. that came up for me. <clears throat> um, thanks, Johan, that's a good question. Uh, maybe I'll just keep it in mind and wait till the end of the call and just let, let uh, more people speak. But uh, maybe I'll give, a, I'll give a quick answer, which is, I mean, I value the kind of cohort here. I know some of you, I don't know some of you, um, but I'm assuming <laughs> you're all brilliant and have uh, uh, expertise that I don't in different areas. And so part of the minimum viable ask I wanted from this is that we, maybe we all, we all kind of see each other because I mean, I, I've not done much to organize my community and host events, right? So I like the idea that, okay, a lot of people are showing up, not just to listen to me, but to see each other and potentially build some consensus. So I ask you to let this session be a seed planted that will that will grow and that the the branches will come back together with each other and with other groups and rhizomatically it can kind of um, foster foster some new some new growth. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, have some hope that there's some for lack of better phrasing some consensus that wants to emerge through this um, through this uh, space organically uh, so did you have an introduction for yeah mm -hmm. um, so Brent just if we applied the framework right now to this call I mean that's a bit what I expected but oh. it's okay I'm, I'm happy to be here whatever um, so there's a little bit of, it's already a map, it's already signposts, yeah? So if, 
the way I understand it, and you can agree or uh, improve it, um, you have a call. You know, looking at the map, it's question. You're either frustrated with something, or you have a passion for something, or you have a question. Yeah, that's before the call. Then you make a call. You call us in, and you already have an idea. You might have a vision. Otherwise, you wouldn't host something at the store later on. So you have a really strong call. Yeah. What usually happens is the next breath. You call a few people what you're doing to find out. I'm just I sensing that, thinking this, or maybe are there others, right? That's a call. Because I saw someone in the Facebook group saying, oh, if it starts with a call, it's already the wrong thing. You have to understand what the call is. You are called. It's very mm -hmm. simple. You know, ring, ring, take it, say yes. And then the next step is, is there a core group around this, for example? And is there a shared purpose that shows up? Is it more about content? Is it more about a particular content? Is it on a process? So you, you seem to have a huge vision. Otherwise, you couldn't even enter in this framework. Yeah, in the end, you have a vision. So if we applied, had applied it, or if we want to apply it, it's like, yes, you have a call. Thanks for showing up. And then everybody, and why are you showing up? You know, and if everybody just would say that two sentences, they could be, I'm here because I know you are going to support it. Fine, it counts. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. It counts. I am curious. It counts. Oh, I know this thing already and I want to know, I want to learn more. You know, all of it counts. Yeah? And if we then had someone typing this up, I know it's recording, so it's a kind of a harvest. And then to cluster, it's like, okay, five people are interested in the leftist, whatever. Five others are this, three have that, and two are just bored, and I don't know. Yeah. So you already could have a much more intense uh, nourishment. Yeah. So that's how why facilitation is great to apply rather than have it sit there as a model and see how it feels for every or what it does for everybody else as a model you know if it just stays on the shelf as a model i don't think it will do much yeah so yeah. i just thought i mean if you we could just hear everybody who hasn't spoken yet why the hell are they interested in us no because it seems there are people who are not just here because they don't know what else to do and uh it could be that something really valuable could show up, which you then, you and, you mentioned two other names, you are already with you, you would have a much more informed field of information already. Yeah? So that, that's like, you can apply it any time, you know, just, mm -hmm. that would be the, you know, and you can answer it in, in the end. I just want to, I just couldn't not say this. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. And maybe I'll just say quickly, and I, I do want to hear from others, but this is, um, I guess the purpose of this is in part for me to do a call and to clarify that call and to talk about the third step is how we invite and design the structure and the process for others and then meet, we are, we are meeting, etc. But so to give a specific answer, I guess, to answer Johan's point too, is like, as it relates to the STOA, my first STOA talk was who's sensing the sense makers. And that was based on some of my written critiques and my experiences. And it, it was sort of a call to the STOA community. And I was disappointed. I can admit the fact that I didn't really uh, impact the way I wanted to. It didn't galvanize a lot of people, although I had good feedback and you know Peter appreciated it. It didn't go anywhere, it didn't move. And so my next talk was on anti-intellectualism, a little more theoretical, kind of just trying to introduce this concept to people and demonstrate how we're all affected and undermined by it, as it's a kind of very strong historical cultural force that invades even think tanks. And then so, you know, to follow up a third Stoa talk on consensus building, and, and Peter has said that this is kind of, for his project, this is kind of um, very appropriate, very kind of crystallization of what he's trying to do. And, and maybe it couldn't have come sooner. It took a year to kind of, for the STOA to be ready. 
And so that's the thrust of, I guess, my call today and in the context of the STOA is to, you know, get your guys' help and have reflexive feedback to make the biggest impact possible on the STOA so that the STOA or Peter can then facilitate consensus building because it's, it's, so, it's so beyond me, but, um, but I want to be heard in those spaces. And that's part of why I, I introduced this, but I also want to hear them through the process. I don't want to hear their feedback, you know, like shouting at me behind a, behind a block or, or whatever it may be. I want it to be uh, engaged and authentic. So yeah, I, re I really appreciate helping me crystallize that. We'll go on to the next person. Awesome. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go to Ryan. Ryan, do you want to unmute? Uh, hey guys, thanks Brent for putting this together and inviting me. Uh, I kind of feel uh, intellectually uh, underdressed, so to speak, but I'm not going to waste any time self-deprecating. Uh, since since uh, Ursula mentioned it, it seems like a good idea. Uh, I mean, I'll say why I'm here. I just when I read your stuff, Brent, and when I've sort of been circulating around these adjacent circles. I just feel pushed, um, pushed to, to question things a little, see things a little differently. And uh, so I, I don't know exactly what I, I'm being pushed toward. I just uh, I try to embrace that sensation and, and just kind of go with it. Uh, and, you know, we talked once before and I, I enjoyed that. And so I'm just here to support this effort and, and kind of engage my curiosity a bit. Uh, and then I'll say the reason that I raised my hand really was that no one else was in that moment <laughs> and I didn't want there to just be silence on the call. So I said, well, I'll just say something. Um, and what stood out to me is like <clears throat> everything that you opened with. I mean, it, it sounds great. It sounds great. But there was, uh, there was a bit of the uh, Jordan Peterson response on Twitter coming out of me when he wished you good luck. I think you'll know what I'm talking about. He, he wished you good luck in regard to what I took as in regard to the idea of consensus building itself. And, uh, you know, it's just like, wow, this is, this is so far out. And even like three, four weeks ago, I think it was like very recently, I was on maybe Rebel Wisdom Facebook page. I don't recall, but there was a mention of facilitation. And I just, to be frank with you, I just, I was like, that's, What's facilitation? You know, that doesn't even that's nonsense. Like if you just want to facilitate something, just facilitate something. So anyway, that was kind of, you know, at the surface prior to this call, but it started to to change when I was reading your article. You know, I was like, oh, this is, maybe there's a lot that I could afford to unpack that I just don't know anything about. And then right after you, we heard from Ursula and Dominic, who, you know, related just some brief experiences that that spoke to like how powerful this process can be. And it was like, it was like a, you know, a, a switch was flipped in my brain. I was like, well, that's crazy. You know, here I was thinking, well, that's ridiculous. You know, it's a great idea, but you're never going to get people to agree. And, and then Ursula's like, no, no, this is a powerful thing that I have literally never failed with. And so, so the result of those sort of different sides, you know, pushed me to just a new point of thought, which is, you know, well, then what are the barriers? Then what are the barriers to implementation? Like if we have this process that works and we know we need this process, like, like you don't need to be an intellectual to realize that consensus is the name of the game for any progress to be made um, in regard to our, I mean, really any kind of problems that we have, whether it's socioeconomic problems or whether they're, you know, the culture wars, like consensus is what we need. So if we have this super powerful tool what I want, just personally, for like my own mind map, I, I would love to understand better. Like, what are the barriers to like? Why aren't people using this tool? Like, why why do we have debates instead of have political debates instead of using this consensus building tool? So anyway, you know, those are the questions, and I, I hope to learn more about them. But thanks again. And that's where I'll end. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Chris, want to jump in? Yeah, I would say like I'm I was pretty interested in your work in general because I think you are having that uh, defense of the progressive voice um, that is 
not really seen as much within these sort of sets making communities and pushing for more of like the sort of steel manning the traditional left um, mainstream media voices, not discounting them entirely, which I really liked. So you, you were pretty uh, good faith in that regard. And I saw your intellectualism, anti-intellectualism talk and thought to myself, yeah, this guy is pretty much in line with the Enlightenment values, like really not that postmodern anti-Enlightenment thing. Um, so that was, that was, that got me some points. And, and, and I think, yeah, I just, I want to like look into the people who are doing this kind of thing, like who are the scientists that really show up and try to do these things so that I can actually look into the history and see like, what are these people doing that other people in this space are not doing? So that's, that's my sort of curiosity. Great. Uh, I wanted to, let's see, Stephanie, did you want to unmute it? Uh, not sure if I want to put you on the spot, but uh, you had some comments in the chat. Sure. Hi. Hi. So I was just saying that I came in to just say hi, because I was really interested in the initial draw of the call, which was how we come together as the world comes apart. And that's going to have been a big question that I've been holding for a long time and, and spending a lot of thought on. And, you know, one of my personal uh, tendencies is to constantly drill down to the assumptions behind every thing we hold dearly in society and just to see where it comes from and what's the source of that. And it, it, it always comes back to value. What is value? What is truth? And people can't really seem to agree on that stuff. And that kind of keeps the buzz going of everybody trying to solve things. And, you know, politics, it seems to me, is a sense of us all trying to do that. And um, I, I may end up getting <clears throat> abstract a little bit here because this is abstract thinking, but if you apply it to yourself, it's just a pattern. And, you know, if you, I mean, I spent some time in um, Native American healing circles and, and how that process of indigenous wisdom works. And the consensus there um, helps hold some coherence in their societies. And what they've done is understood that primarily, you know, the way we apply value in a market sort of consensus reality is a fiction that's holding us back. And, you know, good and bad are relative ideas and we keep applying them in all kinds of random ways. Um, and we can't really do that. And truth, there isn't really an outside universal truth. It, truth comes from the heart. And if you're not thinking with your heart intact in your intellect, then you, you, you don't have any idea of what truth is. So that, that was why I came. I just wanted to see if any of my sort of theories and uh, patterns of sense making would fit here or would there be any place for it? So that's, that's really all. Well, uh, I'm, I'm still working off of what Ursula brought up and Dominic touched on and it can also get into what Stephanie just said, um, coming from the heart um, a lot of things involved in facilitation as opposed to just having a conversation or a meeting when you're actually facilitating you're not just focused on what's being explicitly said and what people want to do you have to focus on um, what I call the implicit ways of knowing which would be how do people like to participate how are they feeling when they participate what's their emotional connection to what's being spoken of and what are, what's being done and also another implicit aspect that's often sort of overlooked is that the perspectives that people are coming from. So not necessarily how they do things, but um, how they approach knowing in the first place, how they approach participating in the first place. Um, I've seen, I used to preside over some meetings in some like some college organizations. Um, and as as a as a president, it was 
I noticed that the meetings, the way that meetings tended to go awry was if those types of implicit ways of knowing people's feelings, basically their values, if people felt like they were being overlooked. So if you're focused so much on what are the action points, what are we doing, what kind of claims are we making, um, what are our propositions for the day, people would generally tend to feel a bit stifled and repressed. And when any type of drama would happen and things would get sidetracked, it would be people bringing up all these things about their values and any dissonance they felt about what was going on. And the reason why that would happen is because we didn't make space, we didn't make space for that implicit knowing from the very beginning. So um, I would say the grown zone of consensus making can be made a lot less grownier if people are invited from the beginning to speak openly about their perspectives, speak openly about their ways of knowing in general, how they come to the conclusions they've come to, where they're at right now, and make that explicit so it doesn't just remain, you know, just bottled up, essentially. Um, another thing that can happen is if people feel like all of that stuff is stifled, if they don't feel like they're authentically participating, they're just sort of there for the ride and just sort of being jerked around, all that stuff bubbles up later and then that takes over. So then you get sidetracked from practical considerations. You get sidetracked from the claims that you're making. So it kind of shifts from implicit being completely repressed to it just spewing out all over the place and suddenly you've lost track of what you're actually there for. So it needs to be balanced out from the beginning. And I would consider authenticity to be the inclusion of those implicit ways of knowing from the very beginning or else people feel sort of beside themselves and they're not, they can get sort of, they can check out. You can actually really actually mentally dissociate from the experience if there's too much of a fixation on one type of knowing and not the other. So I would give a functional definition of embodiment, meaning that you defixate on any particular ways of knowing and you only focus on what is currently relevant to what's going on. In a consensus building project, participation is absolutely 100% relevant and perspectives are absolutely 100% relevant because that's what people are coming to the table with. Regardless of what you're doing in the process, that's how people are arriving. That's, the, that's how they're approaching the situation. So if you don't take those implicit ways into account, people are coming with all this stuff, bringing it to the table. And you're basically saying, I don't care about that. Let's just get our action points done. And then suddenly people check out and dissociate. So facilitation. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, Carrick. Uh, Dominic, did you wanna circle back with us? Yeah. Um... I'd like to make a practical example. So um, we came to, uh, it's Jochen, is that right? Yes. Um, so at the, uh, from a facilitation point of view, when Jochen presents his, uh, um, his question, uh, it's also a very interesting process awareness reflection you make is that you say, I lose concentration and I think, oh shit, why am I losing concentration? Well, because I want to know what the practical question is. And this disturbance in the field um, is always incredibly valuable from a facilitation point of view. And what happens immediately afterwards is exactly the power dynamic that I mentioned in the beginning of the, when I spoke the first time, because uh, Brent says, no, we're not going to do that now. Um, but he's actually directed the question to Jeremy, whom Brent has announced is the host, but doesn't have the rank of the Brent in the conversation. Uh, so then, Brent, I think you kind of sense that maybe something is uncomfortable. So you say, well, you know, we could probably do it a bit later, but we'll sort of see, you know, how that's going to go and so on. And uh, what I'm trying to point at is that at this point already, Chris has left the comment to say, 
um, well, to what degree does one really sort of need to take your own stuff into a proposition? Um, and this dynamic, I think we can probably expect is going to color a lot of the exchanges in this group. I mean, the dynamic sets itself very, very quickly. Um, and also to mention the awareness that, for example, Lehman, who has uh, amazing experience and background in all of this stuff, is just quietly sitting and observing, probably making some uh, groundbreaking observations, which you may or may not later want to share with us, Lehman. Um, but the fact that you do sit and observe it, the fact that many people do know you within the context of your work, not necessarily you as a person, is again a layer of awareness that we don't consciously bring into this. And to circle that back to these two really crucial issues is one, what are our agreements? What have we agreed to do? Ursula wrote in the, in the chat, uh, what are the obstacles since we have this amazing technology? Well, the obstacles, uh, it actually is just one obstacle. It's about awareness. What are we aware of? What, what, what agreements have we made that everybody is aware of? Have we appointed facilitators that we're aware of? Do we have agreements on the ethics that we engage with? They sound like really boring things until somebody gets cut off in a conversation and not even in, in, in within their own feeling realm, start to act out other voices within the group. I'm sure a lot of other people in the group had the same experience as Jochen and wonder, shit, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to make consensus on. Are we all going to become leftists? Uh, do we want to vote for Bernie? Uh, what's the consensus going to be? You know, um, So um, we could save a lot of time. And I think that one of the crucial issues about precisely what you're wanting to do, Brent, is that this really needs us to be slow. You know, this is like slow hand stuff. The ideas we can talk about really quickly, they're fantastic. They're like so mesmerizing and lots of great words. And, um, but in the end, the thing that actually holds um, has got to hold at a different level than, I don't know, to use an integral metaphor, we use teal words, but we work with it at a level of, of red or orange. Um, and then we all split up into our tribes and we sort of say, yeah, Brent, you know, he's, he's always got some fucking leftist agenda going on. I thought this was about consensus and learning something new. Um, okay, that's me. But I'd like, can I go, Jeremy? I, yeah, I think so, else? unless anyone has an urge to respond there. Okay, yeah. No, because it just fits to what um, Dominic said. Um, so this emergent example, yeah. So uh, there is the art of hosting. I don't know if anyone heard of this before. It's not any more facilitating. It's another layer. Yeah, and Carl Fanson, she's part of that movement. She's a practitioner of that. Because um, these processes, the eight breaths, I actually call them, um, I don't call them, depending, process architecture for emergent processes. So even officials, I work a lot with officials in national administrations who are kind of, and I usually go, um, why do you want this? Do you want to change something? Will you change, if there is a different result after this process, would you then use that result for your decisions? And if the answer is yes, I will do it. If the answer is no, I won't, because it's not just about the fad of doing stuff participatorily. It's because if someone is alive, you can work with them. If they are not anymore alive, this process doesn't work, because you, have, you need some living energy filled. And you need some either, you know, hosting practice or um, circle, you know, maybe circle, circle agreements of uh, what are they called? These two ladies from Whitby Island who took it from the natives and put it in a language that we can actually go with. Whatever, and I don't know what Dominic does, but there are many different ways you can pick it up. If you're a more advanced facilitator, you will always be hosting the whole, hosting an intention. You will have people check in. It just has the, so there is the attitude behind. 
and the process and the art of facilitation. Yeah. So, um, what I try to not have happen is that people are, just have to listen to me when I'm downloading. I mean, if someone is super um, charismatic and tells a story, you might hang on their lips, but you still you have something to say. So all together we make it complete because if each of us holds a subjective piece of the universal truth. I saw Stephanie saying something about universal truths. Well, there are multiple truths, first of all, to start with. And then maybe we can find something beyond. But first we have to allow all our multiple subjective truths to be there without criticism, just to stand there because I'm who I am and Stephanie is who she is and Chris is, you know, we, we can't fake it. If we want to, we can, but we don't go on with faking anything. So it's about collecting those truths and working with emergence. And if someone comes in and tries to hijack the process, well, we have to be strong enough to see, is it hijacking? Or is it something that I've left out in the design? Yeah, so Jochen just asked a super authentic, innocent question. Hey, what about me? This is boring. I mean, sorry, I'm paraphrasing. Because we all love to speak ourselves. So the way I design stuff is everybody gets to talk right away. Small groups, everybody's spoken. We could do this with 200 people. Then I would do small groups with 20. You can give everybody the word. So the pressure to speak and be out there and show how important we are is over yeah we are all important we all have egos fine let them just get out out of the way and then we can be for the whole we need to be ready for the whole maybe we are not you know maybe someone has a sick child over there someone else hasn't slept tonight and it's like what is this about yeah so we need to warm up we need to speak we need to be sh seen so all of this is taken care of yeah, I work a lot with directors general. I work a lot of peop with people who just go from a job where they get their driver and then two years later they think about the next job and they don't even care about making an impact. I always ask them why they're here. And then they say, I've never thought about this. And I, then under time I go like, you better are, could you do it now? But in the end, always something comes out because they're paid for something and I tell them they're bloody paid to contribute. I mean, this is not you because you have a different drive, but there are so many people out there who do something just to be, you know, I don't need to tell you. So it works with different parts of people. Unless you have, if, if everybody's faking it, then it doesn't work. Yeah, it only works with real people. That's what I said in the beginning. Yeah. And you need people who are holding it. I never do it alone. I always have a team, two or three, or I have parts from the organization who collaborate with me. Because holding this is really work. It's really, because you need to be present from moment to moment. Yeah. And you need, if you work with chat, someone needs to go on the chat and you yeah. You need to hold the whole. This is the, the stewarding, actually. Holding the whole, you need to know enough to know, oh, am I throwing this person out because he or she is corrupting it? Or are they contributing and I just couldn't get it early enough? You know? So it's always a thin line about, wow, is what does this person now tell me yeah, or us? Yeah. And if I've said something and maybe, uh, I don't know, layman said exactly the same before, I don't need to repeat it because we are contributing to the whole and it's not like who is uh, the brightest guy to reproduce something. So there are a few things, but I never make any rules before because it's all implicit and people get it. The way I'm inviting and I'm designing, they understand they can't just walk out and talk about it to anyone else. You know, it's and nobody's on on their phones or on their email because it's just made that way that they are getting to talk whenever before they're bored <laughs> and that they can un uh, how do you call that um, empty their cups yeah so it's a seek a beautiful sequence of circle plenary small groups um, and that is the art you need to master and the other art is 
the goals and what questions do we shape so the group makes the answer. That's to me the art form of this. That at each step, is it invitation, is it purpose, is it whatever, you have to shape with some small core group the design for each of the steps. What are the questions? So Jochen just got it right because that was the right question for today, basically. Yeah? And each time that needs to be designed and, and validated by a few other people because I can only see that much, but other, everybody else together, maybe we see 90%. Yeah? And then the event gives us the other 200% that we can only smell, but not completely grasp or know. So I love it because it's an emergent practice. And the last thing before I stop, it only works for emergent things. When you really don't know, it's best when you have no clue at all. Then it's really great. <laughs> and it has to be, be an emergent process doing it or preparing it. You can't do it old-fashioned way, collecting views over email, and then you do it. It doesn't work. It's like a field, what's it called, this Mandelbrot, you know, fractal? It's a fractal. So whatever you design, you need to design it in that spirit. And then you just open it up to a thousand more people or the world, doesn't matter how big. But if your fractal contains everything, it will run. Yeah? And this group is big enough, for example, to create a, a beautiful process holding whoever. Yeah. Thank you, Ursula. Um, I echo Joaquin's uh, felt sense at the moment that maybe we should try to uh, speak with people who haven't jumped on mic uh, for this session. If you do feel comfortable uh, stepping in or stepping onto the microphone, feel free to unmute or just let me know. I'm very curious about Layman at this point. I mean, <laughs> sorry to call you out, but maybe we could initiate Sure, that's fine. I do so much talking regularly. I'm quite content to sit back and look for patterns in what everyone else is saying. Um, I guess I'm trying to feel into why I'm here. And part of that is as an extension of conversations that Brandon and I have had and all these other conversation spaces that I've been in. Part of it is I have this like perverse interest in keeping an eye on higher level discussion groups of various kinds. So I also feel like it's my duty <laughs> to check in with all these things. Uh, for me, a lot of it comes to the, um, the kind of ethical positions that Brent is handling, whereby I think there's a lot of people suffering and a lot of suffering in the world that's still going to happen that needs to be held by some kind of minimum set of meta progressive upgrades. And figuring out what that minimum set is seems really important because there might be a lot of points and positions that people take around the left that aren't really essential. And there might be some key things that everybody can get in on. And like he says, there's a lot of people who have a general spirit of consensus and a general set of understanding around some key issues. But how do those people get a little bit closer so that they can start to mobilize for some kind of unified action? So that's my, that's the ethical side of my interest in being here. And then intellectually, I'm just intrigued by collective dynamics, both the way that we achieve some kind of mutual feeling together, but I'm also really interested in how collective intelligence works irregardless of how we feel. So there's a kind of spectrum between uh, a shared sentiment and a shared style and processes whereby people who don't share very much can get intelligent answers out of that process. And for me, all of that's a subset of a really big view of how the universe operates in general, where I think consensus like processes of convergence are essential elements of how reality operates at every scale. So for me, I'm I'm indulging my interest in the human interpersonal version of that. <laughs> and um, I guess I, I don't really want to go into the observations I'm making of everyone at the moment. I just want to, um, I just want to show up for this is my main feeling and be supportive and be present and 
keep an eye on what's happening and fulfill some kind of ethical duty that I have to help these things go forward in whatever way I can. And I don't necessarily know what that way is. Great. Thank you, Layman. Uh, always a pleasure to participate in these calls with you. Uh, maybe we can go to, to David and in the, in the same spirit as well, you know, I think the question of, you know, what brought us here and, and, and finding that consensus would be a, a good icebreaker. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I missed, I guess I missed the most of the first half hour here uh, due to my own mistake. Uh, so I don't have, I don't have very much to contribute at the moment, but I'm, I'm listening with great interest. Um, and it's crazy interesting, I think, to, to take an observation on all and, and just listen uh, to what everybody has to say. Uh, there seems to be a lot of relevant experience and different perspectives in the room. Uh, so, so why I'm here, um, so I'm part of, a, of an emerging metamodern party, political party in Sweden. And we're prototyping uh, facilitated meetings that we call political labs uh, as a part of like, yeah, scratching the surface of a process for political decision-making. Uh, and that's pretty much aligned with, with yeah, what we're talking about. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think it's, it's uh, I'd love to, <laughs> to talk more and dive deeper in, in this group and similar groups. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, one thing that I'm thinking, I've been listening also to, to the other comments. Uh, and I think like this, this kind of processes, they need to be iterative. They need to be dynamic, adapt to different contexts. Uh, they need to be continuously improved, I guess. Um, fractal, as someone was mentioning. Uh, so I'm thinking is the process if you base a process on this tool or this map, uh, is it self-learning? In in what in what uh, dimensions is it learning, or is it capable of of adapting? Uh, maybe you can make a map of what kind of needs you have when you're making a tool like this, uh, and see if if it fits those gaps. Um, and uh, and then I think yeah, we're talking a bit, Ursula was talking a lot about the, the art form of facilitation, the group sizes and like who to invite. And uh, yeah, you have experience design. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can adapt to different contexts and different group sizes or different questions or, and so on. Uh, and, and I guess you can have a map also, or at least pointers uh, to that, like how do we, how do we adapt this tool uh, to different contexts or different situations? Uh, but I haven't dived deeply enough into it to see how much I think it does. Yeah, well, thank you, David. Uh, it sounds fascinating. I'd love to uh, keep in touch about what you're doing and, and uh, the political process you're working on, directly relevant, I think, to many of our interests, especially Brent and myself. Um, Tanner, would you would you like to unmute, share a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, Brent kind of alluded to this also, but uh, I'm here mostly because I'm a part of a game B space, um, a community hit that I noticed they have some consensus within that community, but I noticed there's all these disparate elements of metamodern thought that they haven't quite integrated. There's still some Jordan Peterson worship. Um, and like the space has a lot of good elements and a lot of uh, enthusiasm and a lot of really good ideas and energy that I just want to um, make sure they're in consensus with the broader Banna Modern movement. Um, because we don't want to lose those people and we don't want to, uh, um, yeah, we just want to have a greater consensus about what we want to actually accomplish in the world. And uh, that's something I was wondering about this question about invite, because 
a lot of the problem seems to be with all these different spaces in the IDW is that they won't, I mean, Brent, you, you've, you've mentioned, they won't even talk about critiques. So how do we even solve this problem if they won't even come into the invite process or if that's something we just need to understand more clearly how to invite into a consensus building project? Yeah. Excellent questions. Um, I think the only person who hasn't spoken yet is Brian. So I'm calling you out, Ryan, if you want to jump in, share some of your thoughts. Hey, everyone. Sorry, I'm just waking up. Um, yeah, this is this has been really uh, great to uh, sit in on. And uh, my, my camera's off because my hair is a mess. Uh, it, um, but I'm, I'm mostly just here to support Brent, uh, who I'm a, a, a supporter of and fan. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> um, mostly to support Brent, who I'm a fan of, and um, really am excited that Brent, you're you know going forward with this process. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of real wonderful uh, talent and um, experiences here to draw on. Um, and Tanner actually just um, echoed exactly what I was going to bring up, which you know doesn't have to be answered now, but maybe someone to consider is just how to get people to the table to engage in this process to begin with and you know I, I was recalling Brent when you were talking about um, some of your arch rivals um, and uh, you know like um, Jordan uh, Hall and you know Nita Roy and you know David Fuller and like how cool it would be to get these people who you've had big you know disagreements with or, or conflict with to the table and and you know what's the background process of of the infight and the framing and um and i think there there can be some potential for um maybe not starting with the biggest names but you know getting the ball rolling and showing once the success of this is demonstrated and people would say hey wow you know this is really like a really well done i i feel like i'd be safe or you know um, treated well in this space and and some real collaborative consensus is, is really being generated here. Um, so I think that that can be really a powerful tool to really unite all of these, a lot like some of the ironic tribalism that's happening in the meta tribes um, and kind of kind of uh, bridge building in that way. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to what comes out of this. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. I guess I'll just throw in my, my two cents into the pot or my 25 cents for Brent and, you know, uh, obviously I'm here to, to support Brent as a friend and also as somebody who has mutual interest in forging these connections and ties. I think um, it, it's interesting what's going on at the STOA right now or, or not going on at the STOA. Um, but I, I think part of my desire to learn about these kinds of, um, uh, this kind of facilitating work is to have better tools to bring together for me, particularly, um, this is like a word Michael Brooks said, but we want to innovate on the left, but I think also we want to innovate in the sense-making regenerative culture communities and find places that overlapped very, very, very acutely, like the Progressive International on the left. It's a very interesting organization. They have very similar goals in mind in terms of combating this existential climate crisis. And here we are in our communities talking about systems theory and complexity and cultural evolution and a lot of interesting tools and insights and even community practices that could benefit not only the left, but also what the left has to offer, I think, our communities and just being more historically literate and socially engaged. So I think there's a lot of potential in this in-between space. And rather than it being a tension or just a gap where people fall off and don't talk to each other or kind of uh, gaze at each other, uh, you know, as strangers, you know, on, on a particular one-off stoa session and go, okay, they're doing some weird stuff on the left. I guess they want to be part of this syncretic community and then back away. But I, I want to get into that place of mutual transformation. So that's, that's what I'm interested in. If I could add something about um, how we bring systemic, I guess, systemic critique to the table and how to, how to infuse that in, you know, other spaces. One thing that I've noticed is 
a lot of movements that are already built already around social causes, they already have procedures and, and ways of doing systemic critique. They might just use different language than we might use in an integral space or a metamodern space. So being able to defixate your own use of language and be able to be able to notice and tell when somebody else already has a systems view helps because you might end up just being sort of redundant trying to teach them basically I, I don't i don't know the idiom i think it's like um you're teaching them how to rebuild the wheel or whatever when they already know they already have their own way of doing something so you have to you have to be kind of humble and realize not everybody uses integral language or metamodern language but they're doing the same thing already so you don't want to go in and be like this is how to do systems critique. This is how to be critical thinking, blah, blah, blah. This is how we do it in integral. And it's like, that could be redundant and also kind of arrogant and insulting to some people because they'll see we're already, we already know how to build consensus. We already know how to sense make. We just don't call it sense making and consensus building. We just do it, you know, that sort of thing. There's a lot of, a, I guess you could call it street epistemology that people who are more into systems theories really do need to understand because if you can't see the wisdom and the street epistemology in other people you just come off sounding very out of touch overly cerebral um and a lot of people take it as kind of elitist yeah plus one or plus five to that actually um that's one of the the, the tensions I've, I've observed again and again in in these sorts of discussions so yes important uh Joaquin um yeah thanks so I just want to reflect back to the group that I just noticed looking around that we had a moment where like seven or eight people were smiling for as far as I can tell the first <laughs> moment during the call and maybe a little bit like in line to what Dominic said about like the experience of power structures and uh, Ursula I loved when you kind of made the little pun at, at some point about my question, like where, you know, Jochen just was, was asking, what the heck is this all about? And I really feel that, especially in a group context, I very much appreciate if someone manages to insert just this right amount, not too much, not too little of, and I wouldn't call it self-deprecating humor, but just to, rem to remind everyone, yes, we, we feel passionate about this and we do want to solve a huge problem, but at the same time, if we take the situation so seriously that we can't leave space for this kind of social glue of like enjoying it, then I think it will not, then, then, then I think we're going down the ditch already. So I, I really wanted to, to point this out and really say that I'm now very much enjoying the call. So thank you. Great, great. Uh, any, any other comments or thoughts? I'd like, I actually would like us to circle back to Brent and, uh, here, Brent, how you're integrating some of these comments. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I saw Dominic's hand go up. So if he wants to say something, then I'd be happy to to riff for a bit. And, you know, I'm conscious of the time, too, and how long people want to go. So we'll go, go ahead, Dominic. Thanks. I think that, again, um, sort of the facilitation issues that Jochen brings up that the more awareness we have of what's going on tends to increase the quality of our conversations and of our results. Uh, and taking up these issues about inwardly reflecting groups where there's established cultures, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as we take on a broader diversity, then those uh, conversations become more difficult. One of the issues that helps here is to name those roles like Kenrick is saying that there's uh, possibly an elitist role or, uh, and, and actually bringing these roles into conscious awareness of a group helps us to disidentify and to release some of the tension of, of the potential conflict that it brings so that I can talk to you, Brent, and say, okay, you know, I get that you take on this kind of denigrating um, elitist role you're really good at, at using epithets for people who, whose work you seemingly don't respect. That may not be what you intend to do, but that's definitely in the language that you use. But if I'm not on board with that, I could feel like you're just being an asshole. 
you're just really using a whole bunch of language to establish some sort of, of um, uh, dominance in a situation that you don't even need to do that. And since you don't need to do it, well, I can kind of assume that you're insecure. And since you're insecure, I can probably lead to the conclusion that you're scared. And if you're scared, you're probably dangerous. And you can understand uh, why I'm promoting the idea of let's get the smelly fish on the table, you know, um, because it, 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 it helps to establish a context, uh, a space, uh, like you're pointing out, Ursula, that uh, we can actually make the real building blocks that leads to a consensus in which neither of the issues being raised gets to be the consensus of the day, that the emergent thing is completely different to where we've been before. It's neither of the left or of the IDW or of any of these, these uh, uh, particular identities, uh, but into a, a, a new space, something that is new and creative. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, that's actually really helpful and a good place for me to, to pick up off because <laughs> yeah, I laughed too when you said epithets because I do, I, I don't hold back from, from uh, critiquing someone aggressively and even critiquing their character. And I, I distinguish it from ad hominem if I think their character flaw is part of the problem, part of the critique and how they interpret information or disseminate information. And, and, and what occurs to me, like, you know, with all due respect to, to Ursula and Dominic, because they have experience and, and knowledge that I don't, um, I mean, I, what I want to say is I, I respect, obviously, the more sort of uh, civil, noble path to intervention and conflict resolution. But part of my lament is like, I don't actually see anything working, you know, so I'm sort of, you know, sacrificing myself and putting myself out there. And even if I call someone names, I'm going to back it up. I'm going to say, come challenge me on those grounds and we'll hash out that conversation. So there's a bit of frustration just about nothing working, right? And the spaces that I critique, Integral, IDW, so on, they have not created any type of invitation for the people they're critiquing, right? They're punching left. There's no invitation there. There's just hostility and epithets in that direction in the first place. And so I'm trying to expose those double standards and hypocrisy and say double standards and hypocrisy are not okay. And that doesn't mean I have all the answers. My super theory is, is pr predominant, but but just to say that the hypocrisy is not okay, we're not going to make any progress together. And ironically, as aggressive as some of these IDW figures are, they're getting enormous traction. So it's always ironic to me that these, these aggressive kind of sem semantic violence uh, tactics actually work. And then people are criticizing me and saying, oh, you can't do that. Oh, that that's not going to work. And you know, it's it, it's not always working because what I'm trying to do is like thread a very tight needle to, so there's not a large audience for high high concepts like metamodernism, right? Even though it's so relevant to the public uh, public discourse about postmodernism, right? You'd think for all the people that use this term, you'd think they'd want to hear from other fields, from other uh, discourses. You know what? What is this metamodernism thing emerging, right? And there's there's just been nothing but friction along that access axis, rather than in, engagement and invitation. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to be paradoxical, I guess, to reveal the paradox. I'm trying to be a, a provocative gadfly, a, a kind of muckraker, but also to try to offer the best steel man version of what they're all trying to do you know and so these intellectual spaces should be trying to build consensus and should be inviting precisely what they're blocking which is kind of sociological thinking sociological theory perhaps even socialist politics and what that actually means in 21st century terms right where there's actually burgeoning support for that concept for that movement so again, I bring it back to this idea of just disclosure and also to, again, to embrace what Dominic and Ursula are saying as much as I can, but also try to, you know, 
try to promote the idea that there are lectures that we should listen to. We should all, you know, sit around and, and direct our attention to one person who has something important to say. One of the moments that's pivotal in my intellectual radicalization and actually mention it in the emergencia number one article is benjamin bratton's anti-ted talk right he gave this ted talk in 2013 it's called what's wrong with ted talks and it's just a brilliant 12 minute kind of crash course on on how this whole institution that that's become so popular has just gone off the rails and kind of you know, it's kind of a race to the bottom of thought leadership, whereas we actually need uh, what Bratton is doing and what he's proposing in his broader work, right? So, so I'm trying to, you know, in that Emergencia series too, I was actually trying to establish some sort of overlapping consensus between the thinkers that I invoke in that, in that series, right? And, and, you know, it was presented in a pretty sort of formal professional way because I worked on it with Jonathan Rousen. Um, but for whatever reason, it still didn't galvanize those people to talk to each other, to prioritize kind of that, that um, synth synthesis. And, and here we are like a year and a half later. I mean, these things are still critically important. And all of your feedback here today has been not just practically useful, but <clears throat> very fulfilling in an embodied sense, right? Because you all get to speak, I, I get to hear you. I really enjoy just sitting back and listening for, for quite a while there. And, and uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of close out this session and give my, my final thoughts. Um, and uh, the next step obviously is to, is to uh, have more facilitators and to learn how to facilitate myself and to, to just actively cre create these opportunities and host these things. So uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody. And anybody, any, any further comments or questions, I'm, I'm happy to keep going. Yeah, definitely for me. Um, when I mentioned elitism, I in no way intended to implicate anything about people using epithets or name calling or voicing their frustration the kind of street epistemology I was talking about might look at people who are averse to name calling and conflict and look at and think that that is a sign of elitism, that people aren't being willing to be real and transparent. I'm seeing that Brent too is rather a small fish in a very large pond. He's, you know, he's sort of looked at hypercritically for being even remotely frustrated and being transparent with his frustration. I don't see that as an elitist dominance posture. I see it as a very typical way that most people communicate. And the only spaces I've been in where people are take that as an affront and start psychoanalyzing it tend to be these sort of circumscribed, very, very narrow participation spaces, integral metamodern spaces that are sort of cognitive intelligentsia or whatever. They're filled with people who are very, very conflict avoidant and they take very typical transparent parts of speech. When someone gives an epithet or a name call or whatever you wanna call it, they actually are being transparent about their feelings and their values. And part of the repression that I was talking about that can lead to problems later on is when that kind of stuff is repressed or it's fixated upon and made into something and psychoanalyzed, you know, someone, someone's a little self-deprecating or makes an insult to somebody else. The last thing you want to do is start vivisecting them and like lobotomizing them and trying to like make deep character judgments about them being, I'm sorry, Dominic, dangerous or using an epithet. That is a, that's a, feeling you have, but I, you can be, I guess that's part of transparency too, but then you get to a point where it's just like you're digging in and making assumptions about someone and you're just adding extra layers of complication to what might've just been something about Brent's disposition. You know, I've talked to Brent in private. He's a lot more open about his more biting critiques than he is in private. So obviously it's just part of his communication style it's part of how he processes his emotions. I think it's healthy and typical and I guess 
normal, whatever that is, and the degree to which, you know, he filters himself in public is actually quite high. And to see it, that's still being, you know, he leaks out a bit of frustration and honestly just sets boundaries with what he believes in and what he stands for being seen as an elitist dominance posture. That's not what I meant at all. Actually, I kind of meant the opposite, the kind of conflict avoidant, conflict averse, almost allergic to normal ways that people communicate. That's what comes off as very elitist to most people who are outside of our spaces. You know, you know, the list of logical fallacies that people get fixated on, they found on the internet or something like, oh, you used an ad hom, oh, you did this, oh, you did that. Now I'm gonna make a million presumptions about you. I don't find that helpful at all. That would be a layer of complication rather than complexity. And a lot of it's just baseless. Some people just call people names as a way to express frustration as Walk, well, I think his name is Walk, Yoke, Yoke, Johan, Johan said, sometimes an insult is just an insult and diving into psychoanalysis and psychopathologization, like calling someone insecure or, or saying that they're dangerous. I find that that is, no matter how you phrase it, no matter how polite you are when you say it, that's an escalation of conflict and it's not helpful at all and can make you seem very elitist. So now Kerry, I've got- Kerry, did got you something. get that I was expressing a role? I don't know what that means. Did you get that I was expressing how people respond to Brent when they completely misunderstand his intentions? What I'm trying to yes. convey here is how easily it, it is, how easy it is to hijack uh, what may be a, a, a uh, common direction. I mean, I don't personally think that Brent is insecure. I don't personally think that Brent is anything. I think that that w I understand his frustration. I think it's a pretty healthy response to an environment in which there is repression of just about any sense of effect. I mean, that's my personal view. But yeah, as a, I guess from, what from, you're a, from a facilitatory is... point of view, I'm just saying um, th that we carry with us particular badges. I brought up uh, uh, Brent's badge as a, as a continuation of your mentioning use of language uh, and attitude and how that, that, that may or may not contribute to a dynamic. I don't even want to say that it makes a dynamic better or worse, just that the dynamic exists. Yeah. And yeah, that the it... more awareness there is around what roles we play in that dynamic can lead to a much higher result, uh, a much more integral and informed result uh, of the goal that we are trying to create a process towards. So sorry if I was unclear, I was, I was more uh, giving voice to a particular kind of, of uh, role or experience. My apologies. Um, well, if people put that many roles on one person, eventually they're going to conflict because the role of him being a facilitator. I don't even know if he signed up to be a facilitator of this conversation. He might need to take some of his biting critiques away so he doesn't step on other people's toes. But if other people don't see him as the facilitator, they see him as sort of the firebrand for the conversation, they're going to be disappointed that he didn't do that. So being clear yeah. about your, I can agree with you on that. People need to be clear about what their role is in a conversation. And the rest of the people who are participating need to be clear about that role as well. So, you know, if someone has an objection to way, the way that someone's operating, that person can say, I understand your objection, but this is my role for this conversation. This is Ooh. the role I'm taking. So please have some grace and graciousness for that role. So, yeah, yeah I give, think uh... getting everything out on the table as quickly as possible helps prevent a lot of the groaning later on. Sure. I want to give Brent a chance to, to close us out because I know a couple of us are having to leave now so uh thanks yeah i don't really think i have any final thoughts just just to say thank you i think this was a success maybe on its own terms even if undefined terms um because i loved hearing from everybody and you know it sort of galvanizes me and uh you know the the support means a lot because you know part of what i'm trying to disclose again is that um you know, the, the, like many attacks have come my way in these spaces, right? And so that is a, that is a, a intrinsic problem of 
integral theory, for example. And so that, and Jeremy and I have talked about this a lot because Jeremy has an integral background. Layman has one, Michael Brooks had one and th their worldview and their politics and their process is very different from the bulk of the participants in those online spaces, which are centrist, moderate and reactionary. And if they're authentic intellectual, intellectual spaces, you know, those modes of being politically are, have no through road to, uh, you know, feminism or environmentalism, you know, they just want to kind of pump the brakes on, on change. Yet there's this intellectual aspiration to abstraction for stage development, for systems change, for paradigm shift. And, and I think, um, you know, I'm trying to promote this idea, especially via practitioners like Ursula and Dominic, that um, we need to we need to iterate this process even further so that it so that it can definitively solve things like climate change, things like the Israel Palestine conflict, right? So we can do all of this blo block removal and in a public way if necessary. So, so that we aren't compromised. So I like what they were saying about how it always works, right? And, and I agree. I tried to, to make that clear in the article that it works in conditions of, of high uncertainty and low trust. And that if you, if you put your faith in the process, it's, it's demonstrably effective in, in, by some metric, right? But in terms of the meta crisis, are we avoiding further collapse? Are we um, mitigating further collapse? Are we investing in the right sectors? It, it seems no, we're either going in reverse or stagnating, you know, with a kind of Biden administration that is incoming. And so I, my, my higher call to all these communities is to like to converge around not just the process, but some of the key concepts, some of the key ideas that uh, these different attractors like metamodernism have helped foreground. So yeah, so the real litmus test of success is will the Israel-Palestine conflict resolve, right? And this is a geopolitical thing, but the U.S. plays plays a like extremely large role, and so it's we're all kind of invested in it, whether we realize it or not. And so there's there's a ton of baggage to unpack here historically, and a ton of responsibility to take on. And uh, many of these topics, right, the, the UK election, Brexit, the 2016 election, um, the people sort of proclaiming to lead the charge have been like civil on one front and then very hostile on another in order to promote their own kind of agenda or to amplify the, the, the voices of some frustrated people but fundamentally at the cost of a kind of public truth, right? So since 2016, we're in this kind of post-truth crisis. And um, I don't believe it's inevitable. You know, I, I'm calling on people who aspire to intellectual spaces to embrace the complexity and the conflict with unpacking these topics and be prepared to lose the debate and be prepared to gain a ton through the dialogue and deliberation to actually get a resolution to these problems. Awesome, thank you, Brent. Really appreciate today. Uh, I hope we do this again. Thanks. In and around the STOA session and after. All right, take care, yeah. everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great, thanks.